John Shepherd, and today we're going to talk about protein. Now protein is a macronutrient that many athletes, sprinters and jumpers in particular, swear by. I've got an expert with me today, Andrew Hamilton. So we're going to talk to Andrew and ask him some questions about protein and hopefully this is going to help you use this macronutrient to the best of your abilities in order to improve your performance. Here's a list of what's coming up in the first part of this video. So Andy, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background and your expertise. Well, I've been involved um, in training and fitness um, ever since I was uh, 18. Um, started as a runner back in those days when you went running. Um, people used to look to see who was chasing you because it wasn't a popular sport. So I developed a kind of thirst for particularly the nutrition side of performance. I ended up doing a chemistry and biological chemistry um, because that really underpins um, nutritional science. And I've been working as a writer and researcher, I had over 800 uh, articles published uh, about sports nutrition, sports performance. My main job now is to research um, sports science, sports nutrition, and see what the latest science is saying and put that into, into plain English. So what's so great about protein? Why is it um, so beneficial for power athletes? It, it's the building block of um, much of your of your body. Um, okay, yeah, your body is uh, 55 to 70 percent water, but much of the tissue and uh, the muscle tissue in particular is is made from uh, protein. Protein can take many many forms. So uh, the protein in muscles is different to the protein, uh, for example, in your heart. Uh, different uh, to the protein that. Um, are involved in making your immune system function. You can think of protein as assembled from building blocks, which you probably know as amino acids. Mm -hmm. And amino acids are a bit like letters of the alphabet. You have um, 20 amino acids or so that humans use, um, but of course they can describe an enormous array of different structures. Muscle protein is obviously uses different amounts and different ratios and different arrangements of, uh, of building blocks. Um, compared to the proteins that you get, for example, in blood cells. The genes tell the cell how to assemble um, these amino acids. So a muscle cell, will, the genes in there will tell, tell that cell how to make, how to synthesize muscle, muscle protein. What about natural sources of protein? Are eggs, dairy, etc., lean chicken, fish, better sources than supplements? Uh, egg protein is a very, very um, good protein because it contains um, all the amino acids we need in, in roughly similar ratios to you know, what, what we need as well. Um, however, it's not just about consuming a protein that has the same amounts and ratios of amino acids. Because if you remember, I said that you need to degrade the protein, break them down into the individual building blocks, and then reassemble them. Okay, well, the way that your body breaks down different proteins varies according to how they're assembled. So, um, for example, soy protein um, takes a lot longer to break down into the individual amino acid building blocks than does whey protein. Um, so, for example, if you um, need, um, if you're in a situation where you're trying to recover from exercise and your muscles need a boost of protein to you know to get going to, to start the recovery process. They need that quite quickly, and in those circumstances, whey protein can be a better protein because it's easily um, it's easily or rapidly disassembled, and um, it can provide all the right amino acids once it's disassembled to to help you build up protein. So there are different different proteins have different benefits at different times. What about macronutrient distribution? Macronutrients being carbohydrates, protein, and fat. What about manipulating the ratios of those macronutrients, perhaps in favor of protein? Okay, um, well, there's a number of different issues there. Mm. Um, I mean, what we can say is, um, in, in the past, the conventional view was, well, you know, athletes are more active than, than sedentary people, so they eat more food, and therefore, they'll just get more protein, and that's fine. We've since uh, discovered that actually, for optimum 
um, muscle recovery and growth. And because when you train, you you know you break down muscle, and you want to be able to repair and rebuild that muscle as quickly as possible um, in between training sessions. And obviously, if you're trying to develop more strength and power, that is directly related to muscle mass. So, um, yeah, you might actually want to build that muscle as well. And I think that the consensus now is that the, the athletes do need more per kilo of body weight than do sedentary people. Um, I mean, I'm, I've got a lot of experience with endurance performance, and the, the, the idea was, well, 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight per day would be about right, but now that's been revised upwards to between 1.6 and 2 grams. Now for a sprint or power athlete, it's probably even more important, and because the nature of the training is more intense, yes, there's less of it, but it's more intense, um, and maintaining muscle mass is obviously extremely important, and, and, and building it. Um, so the requirement would be probably between two and possibly two and a half to three grams per kilo of body weight per day. So for a um, 80 kilogram sprinter, 75 kilogram sprinter, mm-hmm. let's say 80 kilograms, you'd be looking at uh, between um, 200 and 240 grams of protein um, in your diet every day. Now that's not 200 grams of protein food, Mm. Because, for example, a tin of tuna is about 26% protein. So if you have, um, you know, if you have 260 grams of tuna, only a quarter of that tuna is actually protein. So you need to work out roughly what the, what the protein content of your food is, not just what kind of food you're having. I'm often asked about the protein needs specifically to an individual athlete. Can an athlete work out... Sp- well, again, specifically, how much protein they'd actually need per day? Okay, well, it's quite straightforward, really. You would uh, look at the labels on, on your food that you're eating, particularly protein-rich food, and on uh, the labels, you will see that it's broken down. So, for example, um, you always, if you look on the label, you'll see per 100 grams, how many grams of carbohydrate, protein, fat. So, you can... Um, you can use that figure to determine the percentage protein. Um, so if it says 26 grams, 100 grams of protein on a tin of tuna, you know it's 26% protein. So if you have a, a tin of tuna weighing 200 grams, you, you, you multiply 200 by 26%, uh, which gives you possibly around about uh, 40 odd grams mm-hmm. off the top of my head. Um, however, um, it can be quite an onerous task if you're not used to reading food label um, and keeping a constant track. Um, there are a number of very good apps now available um, where you can li- literally carry a phone around with you, you pop the food that you're eating, um, you, you just tick it from a list and put how much you've eaten. The app will work out the protein um, that you've consumed through the day, it will up for you, along with everything else like, like carbohydrate and fat and even vitamins and minerals, and it will give you kind of displays and printouts if you want that. Um, so if someone's um, trying to make sure they're consuming an optimal amount of protein, something like that can be very, very useful. Is it better to take protein in substantial amounts or relative substantial amounts throughout the training day or is it better to spread this out more gradually? What we understand now is that um, often it's not so much the total amount but it's the way that that uh, protein um, and carbohydrate actually is uh, is fed through the day and depending on what you want to achieve. You start training um, and then you finish training during that training or even competition, if it's a multi-stage competition, you've broken down some muscle tissue. Uh, it turns out that your muscles are most um, sort of willing and able to carry out repair and rebuilding immediately after uh, the training is taking place, immediately after the muscle has been worked. We kind of call it the window of opportunity. So the first hour 
after you've trained, it's particularly important for you to feed your muscles um, the nutrients it needs to rebuild and regenerate. Um, now, that mostly will include protein because you need to consume protein to be broken down into amino acids and then to be reconstructed to help repair and rebuild the, the, the damage that's occurred in your muscles. But it also includes fluid, obviously, and some carbohydrate is also um, important because you will have um, used some stores of muscle energy called glycogen, and that does need to be replenished. Also, another important aspect to including some carbohydrates in your um, feeding with your protein, we now know that when you give a muscle carbohydrate or when you give the body carbohydrates, it stimulates um, a greater release of insulin and that insulin helps to drive amino acids from your bloodstream into the muscle cells. So giving a little bit of carbohydrate helps to drive um, that protein into the muscle cells where it's needed. And ideally that uh, protein needs to be a protein that is broken down rapidly so it can be rapidly reassembled um, during this window of opportunity. And the best protein for that process is whey protein. And it's a bit complicated to explain, but whey, whey because of the way it's constructed, is rapidly, is, uh, the body is able uh, to rapidly degrade it and then reconstruct it. So 20 grams of whey protein taken after training will produce a bigger gain in strength and muscle repair and muscle regeneration than, we'll say, 20 grams of soy protein or 20 grams of casein, which is another milk protein. Is it possible to overconsume protein? There are many, many um, companies out there selling drinks, and they say, we'll use three heap scoops, and that will give you 60 grams of protein after a, a workout uh, or after a training session. Research has recently shown that the human body cannot absorb more than 20 to 25 grams of protein in one feeding. So, um, a far better strategy, rather than having, say, 50 grams of protein in one go, and then just uh, having nothing for the next two to three hours, we can have 25 grams immediately after training, then after another 90 minutes, to take another 25 grams. Um, each surge of amino acids in going into the body, each surge of uh, protein and amino acids, um, the body can only take in about 25 grams maximum at a time. So you're better to have repeated feedings spread over uh, two, three hours than to have one huge feeding straight away and then nothing. Uh, personally, I, I would recommend, um, if possible, that you, you, have, you, you finish your training and then the first 30 minutes you get a recovery drink down you based on whey protein um, then, um, if you can have within a, another hour after that a well-balanced meal contains a good amount of, of high-quality protein, fish, egg, um, you know, lean meat, with some carbohydrate, but, but relatively low in fat, purely because fat will slow down the emptying of the tummy. What about protein before bed? Is that beneficial so that it has an effect whilst you're sleeping? Well, uh, the first thing I would say is that while you or they should reduce the amount that you eat, so you certainly wouldn't want to sit down to a, you know, a two or three course meal, ten at night, um, that makes it <laughs> very easy and make you very uncomfortable when you go mm. to bed. Um, you do need to get some nutrition in. So I would suggest that they, um, as soon as they finish training, literally, down, uh, you know, a, a, a whey-based recovery drink, and then when they come in, have a, a light snack, a light snack, um, and if they can, say they come in at 10 o'clock, have a light snack, and if someone's not retiring before 11, 11.30, that will probably be, yeah, out of the tummy by then, and mm. um, it will keep them nourished through the night. The other thing to remember is when you train, um, your metabolism uh, is raised, remains raised for several hours after you finish training. So you're not just burning energy through your training at a greater rate, that rate of energy burning is increased for several hours afterwards. So therefore, when you have a, a snack, 
um, when you've been training late and you have a snack and you go to bed an hour later, you don't need to worry. You're not going to turn into Mr. Blobby overnight. <laughs> you know, your, your body's firing away. And just one more tip relating to late training and um, sleeping. Some recent research, I say recent in the last year, um, has shown that um, if you, uh, and this has been done with endurance athletes, but there's absolutely no reason why it wouldn't um, apply to sprint power athletes, is that if um, an athlete um, takes a milk protein, a casein protein, now casein is a protein found in milk, it's slower releasing than whey protein. So um, it's not digested so rapidly, so the amino acids take longer to be released from that protein and they take longer to appear in the bloodstream, but they last for longer because it's a much more longer, smoother um, process. So with uh, whey protein, you get a spike and then down, which is what you want after hard training. Casein, you get a, a gentle rise, not so high, and then a gentle fall over a long period of time. So what they found was if you give about 20 grams of casein protein at bedtime, recovery of muscles is superior uh, to when you don't. As usual, thanks for listening. And if you like what we've talked about, um, do give the video a thumbs up and do subscribe to the channel. We're looking to do more videos on the nutritional aspects of sports performance with Andy and I'd like to get some of your comments and feedback as if, you know, whether or not you liked what we did and if there's any specific topics that you'd like us to cover.